Bibles uh, this morning. Please open them to Matthew, the fourth chapter. Uh, I'm just going to read the, uh, verses 1 and 2. And uh, I know I had 1 through 11, I think, on the big screen, but I'm going to just read 1 and 2 because uh, that's what I'm going to focus on uh, this morning. Now, I've entitled this Your Wilderness Temptations. And you'll find out during the message why I titled it Your Wilderness. Jesus had His wilderness temptations, and we have ours. We'll find out about that. So if you have your Bibles and you've turned to Matthew 4, 1 through 11, would you please stand with me for the reading of the Word, and we'll have a short prayer. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. Let us pray. Lord, as we come before you this morning, God, once again, we're just so thankful that you have met with us this morning. Such a blessing was the singing and the songs, Lord Jesus, and the words that penetrated our hearts. And just lets us know that you are in total, complete control. Uh, we're just a, a, a workman. Sometimes not even fit for your kingdom, but we're striving. But God, this morning I just ask that you would come down and that you would bless this remainder of the service, the message and the messenger, just one more time, that we can feel our hearts challenged, that we can feel our hearts convicted. And God, if there's any changes that uh, need to be made within our lives, within our heart, within our mind, that you would uh, show us and we would be humble enough and obedient enough to say, God, I will do that for you because you have done so much for me. And God, I just ask that you would give us an altar service but with open and honest hearts, seeking your help and your words of wisdom. <coughs> and with that, I hope we all go home victorious. Not a need to go out those doors, but that you would meet all needs. As Reverend Hammond said, wherever you went, you showed compassion and you met those needs. I know you're here, you're wanting to meet our needs, and I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, I was thinking and praying this past week, even uh, about our Ash Wednesday service, how the part of our preparation for the Lenten season leading up to Easter is a time of prayer and it's a time of fasting. And that temptation is a part of every one of our lives. It has been, it is, and it always will be. It will always be part of the devil trying to take away from us our joy and our salvation. I was thinking uh, that this morning that each person here, uh, we can stand up and we'll start over here with Karen and we'll go around, we'll end with uh, Hazel. We'll stand up and tell what the Lord or what the devil is tempting us with and what we are going through. We'll tell the deepest, darkest secrets of our lives so the rest of us can know. Not a chance, is it? I wouldn't do it either, guys. I mean, I, I, you know, some of us, if I would learn what Jeff Canfield is struggling with, what he's being tempted with, you know, if I would learn that, uh, I'm hope, hopefully a lot of you would go to your knees in prayer for Amen. Jeff Canfield. Amen. Some of you might go to the phone about <laughs> Jeff Canfield. <laughs> so there's two things that could happen there. And I trust you, but I'd rather just have you to pray for me. <laughs> and we will do you the same way because there's a scripture in the Bible that says there is no temptation that's going to ever come upon us, but it's common. Amen. It's common to man. Jesus was tempted in every way as we are. And He led a sinless life. Now we can do that same thing. And we were going to learn this morning some consequences of being tempted. We're going to learn some uh, effects of being able to come out of the wilderness 
where sometimes we find ourselves. You know, the Bible states that, you know, we can be seized by temptation. We can fall victim to it. We can have our lives consumed with what this old devil throws in here. What we see, what we hear, it goes strictly to here and eventually to our heart. Amen. And how damaging it can be for us when that, that happens. Amen. And this is probably why a long time ago around the 4th century church that they set aside a time which is 40 days prior to Easter to focus on spiritual disciplines. Spiritual disciplines. Nobody likes to be disciplined, do we? Growing up, I hated to be disciplined. But you know what? It was very needed in my life. And even though that I'm an adult, uh, the Lord still disciplines me, and He probably always will be as long as I am human. Because that's the key word there. We're human. We're, we haven't arrived yet. We're still struggling. We're still trying to get through this life and get through it in such a way that we can make it to heaven. But the writer in Hebrews tells us that Jesus was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet He was without sin. So I don't know about you, but that is a real <laughs> encouragement to me because the Lord and Savior knows where we are. The Lord and Savior knows where Jeff Canfield is. He's walked in my shoes. He knows what I'm going through. And He wants to help me. Amen. 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 You know, our identity as God's children needs to have a couple questions answered. One is, who am I? And the other is, whose am I? Amen. Mm -hmm. And you know, as, as I was growing up, and being a, a young teenager, as most teenagers and most kids are, we uh, get a little bit of freedom in our lives. Our parents let us do a little bit more than what they would have when we were prior to being a teenager. And uh, the freedom that I was enjoying was running with some guys and some girls. Uh, and my dad sat me down several times. And he gave me a good talking to about who I was and what was expected of me. And you know, God does me the same way. And, and it's very needed in our, in our lives. My dad had deeper wisdom than just giving me a set of rules of do's and don'ts. He instilled something deeper within my heart because I know that when I was out with my friends now now your friends was probably like my friends instead of living a Christian life they was trying everything they could do not to live a Christian life and to go the opposite way Amen. and I was running with them so guess what I was where they was at and I didn't need to be but God has given us a set of rules. But more than anything, He has instilled within our minds and within our heart, not do this, don't do that, but why we should not do some of the things that we're doing. My dad said in a, a simple way, through his stern voice, it was a gentle voice, but he was very stern, that your name is Jeff Canfield. When you're out, the way that you're acting is going to reflect upon your raising and your name. Amen. Amen. Jeff, remember who you are. He said that when I'm out with my friends, I should not dishonor my name. I should not disgrace 
my name. Amen. I should not harm it. I should not discredit it. Or bring embarrassment to it. Amen. And you know what? Sometimes I did. And he left a very big impression <laughs> upon me. Sometimes on the backside. <laughs> but sometimes it was a, a cut to the heart. Because I could see the disappointment in my dad's face and his eyes when I did not do exactly what he wanted me to do. Now get this, because I'm wanting to relate this not to my earthly father, but to my heavenly father. Amen. When I became a Christian, God told me, He said, You are Jeff Canfield. You're a Christian. Don't dishonor. Don't disgrace. Don't discredit. Amen. Don't embarrass mm -hmm. who you are. Amen. Sometimes, folks, we do that. A lot of times in the crowd I was hanging with, <coughs> I found myself in situations and circumstances that a Christian should not be. A lot of times in the crowd that I was hanging with, I faced choices and pressures from those that were around me to do the things and act in ways that I knew I should not be doing. Amen. I was faced with choices and pressures to do things that was not consistent with the way that I was raised. That was not consistent with the name that I had that was hyphened after Canfield, which was Christian. I claimed to be one. A lot of times I did not prove myself true. I want you to know right now, though. I'll take that back. I want you to know right now. Every situation that I faced, every <laughs> circumstance that I was in, I always made the right choices. <laughs> we know better, don't we? We're human. No, I did not. Right. And when we let ourselves get in certain situations that we know we shouldn't even be there, we know we should not be acting this way, we allow ourselves to the point of temptation that if we say, well, I need to leave right now, they're going to make fun of you. They're going to say, well, you big winner. They're going to say so much things about you that you try to bear it out and still hang on, but you've placed yourself in a situation, you've placed yourself in the circumstances that you know is going to harm you not only physically and emotionally, but man, it's going to kill you spiritually in the life that you're living. You know, in all those moments, if all I had been given was a set of rules, a set of do's and don'ts, and I come upon a, a situation that I'm in, and I pull out that big list of paper and I hold it up and it falls to the floor and I start reading it, so guys, hang on, man, I need to know if I can do this or not. You know, it would be very easy for me to drop that list. It would be very easy for me to discard that list because that would all, it would be all that that was, was just a list. But it was instilled in my upbringing. It was instilled in my thinking. It was instilled through my Sunday school. It was instilled in me and in my heart that it just wasn't a set of rules of do's and don'ts, but it was a way that I should be acting and, and, and behaving and, and reacting mm -hmm. to the situations that I was faced with. I had been given much more than that by my parents. Folks, we have been given a lot more of that from our God. Amen. That we should not be letting ourselves get in some situations and some predicaments that we should not be in. I had a background of being rooted and grounded in holiness. Mm -hmm. I was raised in a denomination that, that believed pretty strict. Mm -hmm. Hair couldn't touch my ears. Uh... Women couldn't wear slacks, makeup, they couldn't cut their hair. I was raised in, a, in an environment that, that was 
considered holiness, but it was more outward appearance instead of the heart holiness that I so much enjoy with the Church of the Nazarene. But I'm glad for my upbringing. I'm glad to know that there are standards and morals and, and a character that I should be held accountable to. Amen. Dad gave me a name to remember. God has given us a name to remember. Amen. Dad said you are a Canfield. Wherever you go, you represent that name. How you act and you react will reflect upon the Canfield name. My God said I have given you a name. You are Christian. You are Christ-like. Wherever you go, you need to resemble that remark. How you act and how you react. Then he gave me that stern warning that I took very serious because he was dead serious. He said, you act in a way that denote, demotes your name and you will pay the consequences. And as I told you, I have paid the consequences. But in the same manner, my God has told me the same thing. You demote my name. You cause it shame. You call it, cause it hurt. You're going to pay the consequences. You know what we do in our lives, whether it's a spiritual blessing that's lost out, or whether it's our faith, whatever it might be, the, we're going to pay for our consequences. You know, this is exactly what God has given to us and our Lord Jesus. He models that, and He did the 33 years that He lived here. It, it, a powerful reality of how that we should live and walk and talk and act. But guys, is just as Jesus, right as soon as He was baptized and the Spirit came down in the form of a dove and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, the very next thing He was led into the wilderness to be tempted. <laughs> I'm so glad that when I went to the altar at Westwood Christian Baptist in 1972, 22 minutes after 10, right there I had my head buried in the palm, praying for God to forgive me. That when I got up in such a happy soul, my sins had been forgiven. Amen. And I wasn't led yes. straight into that wilderness to be tempted. Amen. I wasn't ready for it yet. Jesus was. He was getting ready to model what our lives should be as a Christian. I was a baby in Christ. I wasn't ready for that yet. But while the the crowds that were around Jesus were still buzzing about this spirit that descended and the voice calling out from heaven. Jesus immediately went to be tempted. His first task as the newly anointed Messiah was to prove himself. Folks, I don't know if you know it or not, but you people that are called Christians, we are to prove ourselves in this life. We're to walk the walk and we're to talk the talk. Amen. Amen. Why the wilderness? I, I went back and done some research on the wilderness. This is apparently an abandoned, uncultivated place. And it was not necessarily a desert. It was a place that the Jews uh, thought that demons roamed and evil prevailed. And all of this seems to fit with their belief that the wilderness was a time of uh, great hurt in their life. And you know, we go through the wilderness in our bounds of society. And sometimes we don't even realize that we are struggling in our wilderness. The Jews' fear and anxiety of this wilderness is justified because they spent 40 years struggling and wandering about in it. And you know, they even got to the promised land. They even was able to stand there and look. Man, right there, I can get out of my wilderness. I can get out of it right now. What we'll do, we'll send some spies. Instead of going right into possessment, we're going to send some spies in there and find out if, if, if we can do this. So they sent all the spies in. You know, everyone came out and said, oh, 
It's too great for us. This promised land, we, we need to stay in our wilderness. We need to stay here and just struggle because we can't. We can't overcome. We can't obtain it. Two people, Joshua and Caleb. This man said, it's nice over there. But you, you wouldn't believe it. It's great. It's what God has prepared for us. It's where we've been struggling to get to. It's right there. We need to go and possess it. But because of their fear, because of their anxiety, so if they said, no, no, we can't do that. And because of that, they was every everyone there, except for Joshua and Caleb, they was robbed of their promised land. They weren't able to go there. They all died out before they was able to go in. Joshua and Caleb, a whole new generation went in. But the people that wandered in the wilderness, they died in their wilderness. God, God, guys, right now, I don't want us to die in our wilderness. I want us to go to the promised land. I want us to live above what we're struggling with. Amen. Every single one of us has temptations. Every single one of us are bound by something. But man, if we can get out of our wilderness, and how can we get out of our wilderness? We're going to find out <coughs> very simple ways to get out of the wilderness. You mentioned the, the term wilderness to a Jew even to this day, and it means total failure. It means total frustration. It means temptation. It means torture. It means loneliness. It means heartache. It means heartbreak. It means a total depravity of their God. Amen. And now, into this godless, demon-haunted wasteland, <coughs> the Spirit has led Jesus so He could be an overcomer. He can go in and, and resist these temptations. So the devil, right off the bat, he has three temptations for him. He waits. He waits. I want you to realize this. He didn't get Jesus right when he was on the mountaintop. He waited 40 days that he had fasted and he had prayed and, 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 he, had prayed and, and he was in, his word, in the Word and, and he, he had fasted and, and he hadn't ate for 40 days and 40 nights. And then when he was hungry... In other words, when he was at his weakest moment, he came to him. Amen. That's why he does us. When we're at our weakest, he's going to come and hit us. And he's going to hit us with things that we need in our weakness. He came and said, Jesus, you're starving. You've been 40 days without food. 40 days, not just 40 days, 40 days and 40 nights. Here's some bread. Here, here's a stone. Turn it into bread and man, you could be... Your hunger can be quenched. You can, you can uh, get your strength back. And he used Scripture. He used the second temptation. He used Scripture. He used the... I've got several books back in my office on Psalm 91. And how precious it is to a Christian because it tells us how that we can be overcomers and how that God rescues us and takes care of us in our times of weakness. He, he used Psalms 91 at him. And the, and the devil knew the Scriptures. Did you get that? The devil knows the Scriptures better than we do. He'll use them against us. He'll use them to our detriment. He'll put them out of context. He'll come to you in such a way that he'll use Scripture and you'll think, wow, that's Bible. Maybe I can go ahead and do that and be alright. But every time that the devil came to Jesus and tried to get him off track with what? The Word. Jesus put his life right back on track with the word in context. And finally he said, Satan, <laughs> oh buddy, get behind me. You're not my God. You're not my Savior. You're not my strength. You're not my power. Amen. You don't have anything that I need to sustain me. Oh, I've got a God that's going to supply my every need. And you know as... Jesus was the Messiah. He, he became hungry. He was hungry. He was starving. He was in this wilderness. He was enduring places and things that, that we endure and that we go through. And how that He did it so much better it seems like than we do. You know, because of the devil's diabolical brilliance, He came and He used this Bible. He knows the Word better than we do. He knows how to get to us. He knows our weakness. If, we have a ch if we're a chain, He knows our weakest link. And He goes where? 
to that weakest link. Right. And he'll pull on it to what? It snaps and it breaks. And we've got to have a powerful God behind us. The devil knew Jesus. And he knew how easily that he could have turned the stone into brick. He knows how that when he took him up on the pinnacle and he looked over that he could have thrown himself off and he would have been all right because the scripture said that he would not even dash his foot against a stone. And he knew all this stuff. He even took him and said, you know, he said, Jesus, he took him up on a high mountain. He said, look out through there. This, this whole world. He said, I will give it to you. Wow. The devil had the power to give Jesus our earth Yes, he did. So who does that mean has dominion over this earth? The devil. the devil. So we've got to be very careful. He's going to offer us things. And if we're not careful, we'll fall prey to it. Because he has it to give us. Amen. We need to keep our eyes focused. When that old tempter comes, when the temptations <laughs> comes, when the sin comes... We should not allow ourselves into that situation, into that circumstance, when we know that we can move right here and be out of it. Amen. If I know I'm going to be tempted if I stand over here, I should not stand over here and be tempted. Amen. If I know that I'm going to stand over here and I'm going to be blessed from God, guess what? I need to be standing here. Right. And I don't need to be in the middle straddling the fence. Amen. Because that hurts when you fall. Very badly. You know, the devil acknowledged that Jesus and God was in total control. He had to ask Jesus to accept these temptations. <coughs> now, in our life, we have to accept temptations and sins, when they, and that's when they become a reality in our life. You know, it seems that the old devil has the right things to say to us when we are being tempted. He has the right words. He knows how to get to us. He will use anything and everything to help you to justify what He wants you to be. Amen. Don't let Him derail you. Don't let Him get in your head. Don't let Him get in your heart. As long as we stand for God, the devil has to depart. Just as with Jesus. Immediately Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. I've had enough of you. Three temptations is enough. You've tried it ain't going to work. And we need to make that same justification. What could the devil do? He had to flee when Jesus told him to. You know, I read a, a book recently that described an author's visit to this wasteland, this wilderness. And uh, they say this is about four miles west of Jericho. They say that it's in eastern Israel. And this is a place that history has recorded that Jesus spent these 40 days in 40 nights. This author went and spent a day and a half. He went during the day. He spent that night and the next day. And he went without food or water. And he said he could understand why Jesus probably would have been most vulnerable in a place like that. He said in the day, he said it was scorching hot. He said he was looking for a cleft of a rock to get under. Something to find shade. He said at night time, he said there was weird noises. He said there was total darkness. He said it was freezing cold and he could not sleep because creepy crawly things was everywhere. And he said I, I was not able to sleep. He said so for the day, the night, and the next day, he said I was awake and I was scared and I knew that I was in a place that I did not want to stay and I did not want to stay there 40 days I did not even want to stay there that next night, so I left. He said, I can understand why Jesus would have been at his weakness, but he pulled through it with grand colors. He said, I was there a day and a half, and I was about gone. He said, you know, we're not meant, Christians, people, humans, we're not meant to be in the wilderness. Amen. We're not meant to be there. He's got a paved road for us. And when we allow ourselves to get there, we're going to be uh, miserable. We're going to be hateful. We're going to be doing things we should not be doing. And we're not going to be living a victorious, glorious, blessed, filled life. If we're in the wilderness. Okay. Who's in the wilderness this morning? 
Those that are unsaved, those that are not minding God, and they're not doing exactly what He would have them to do, those are the people that's in the wilderness. And guess what? I guarantee you, if you're in that category, you're miserable. You know to do good, and you're not doing it. So what's that called? It's called sin in the Bible. So if we're committing sin, we're, we're probably in the wilderness, and the devil's having his way. He's, he's, we're in a place and a circumstances and a situation that he's happy with because... Where, where He can use us. Where, where He can tempt us. And, and come at us in our heads and our minds and He clouds our vision. So what's the antidote? We need to cross over into the promised land. Amen. We need to get out of the wilderness. We need to get ourselves back on that straight and narrow course that He has for us. We need to be doing what He'd have us to do. If there's any sin, temptation, trials in our life, we need to ask Him to forgive us for them. We need to be doing exactly what He would have us to do. The blessings, according to the Bible, will start flowing again, just like the stream of the negative. They'll start flowing, and then what, what did it say? Man, they're going to have burst of color. You're going to be joyous. You're going to be happy. Things are going to be going on in your life that you just cannot believe such blessings can happen to a person. And that's waiting for each and every one of us. But a lot of times we like to dabble. We like to stick our foot over into the wilderness. We like to get as close to temptation as we can without it hurting us. We want to get to the edge of the cliff and see how close we can walk that rim without falling off instead of being over in the middle of the road where God wants us to be. <laughs> Today, Jesus has a message of hope for each and every one of us. He has a plan for our life that will set you free from harm and hurt. And He wants you to have this in your life so you can live that victorious life above sin and above struggles that the devil has planned for you every single moment of your life. If today you feel defeated, you feel despair, you know that you're not a Christian, you feel lonely. You feel unwanted. You feel that the devil's plans that he has for you are keeping you from realizing the power that God has for you. It's time to change the pattern of your life. It's time to get out of that wilderness. He's here this morning. I felt him. I felt him since the first moment I stepped through the doors. Through the singing. Larry, wonderful. Even with a sore throat, it's wonderful. But he has better for us than what we are in right now. The wilderness is no place for us. In our weakened condition, in the wilderness, the devil can overcome us. Amen. Jesus fasted, prayed, and meditated on God's word while he was in the wilderness. We must also. This was what got him through. This will be what gets us through. You who are struggling, let us stand.